This is Agriculture Today, and I'm Shelby Varner with the K-State Radio Network. We begin today's show with Dan O'Brien, K-State grain economist, with a grain market update. He says the markets are currently volatile and are weather dependent. Continuing the show is K-State Extension crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth as he gives an update on chinch bugs and discusses false chinch bugs, burrowing bugs, and grasshoppers. Producers could be seeing these insects in different crop fields. A weather update with K-State meteorologist Chip Redmond concludes this week's shows. Chip says Kansas is in another weather pattern and could be feeling warmer temperatures soon. That and more is coming up ahead on Agriculture Today. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and on this Friday, as we usually do, we start our show with a grain market update. And in to give us that grain market update is K-State grain economist Dan O'Brien. Dan, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Shelby. You know, as we not to hop in on you, but I'm just so anxious to talk about the weather market that we've got and all that's going on in the grains that uh, we couldn't be set up more to talk about interesting things, I would think. So talking about the grain market, what are futures looking like? Well, we've had a volatile week here. Uh, Earlier this week, we had uh, a day when uh, corn, soybeans, wheat were all jumping 20, 30, 40 cents, 50 cents for for some of the soybean contracts. That was about Tuesday or Wednesday. And then yesterday, saw the uh, markets give give some of that back, it, it, especially soybeans, not so much in corn or, or in wheat, but for soybeans especially. So uh, I wouldn't say we have unprecedented volatility because, be, because we've seen this before just a year ago in midst of COVID and all that was going on a year or two ago in midst of COVID and then uh, last year with the Ukraine-Russia side of things. But we've seen, in essence, when you go market by market, we've seen uh, on yesterday's markets, July corn closed at 660 and, and a half, and that's up basically 56 cents from the 9th of June. So from the 9th to the 23rd, about a 56 cent increase. Dece corn, which is what we're looking at for the bellwether signal of where new crop prices could go, closed yesterday at 620 and three quarters, was basically at 530 two weeks ago. So, so we've had that much of a run up driven by dry conditions in the Western Corn Belt. We'll probably talk about that excuse me, in the east, central and eastern Corn Belt. Uh, and you can see it on drop maps. We'll probably, if we have time, we'll talk about that more so later. Soybeans closed yesterday, uh, the July contract at $15. So we're back over 15. We were uh, two weeks ago at 13.86. So we've gained about a dollar thirty, a dollar thirty-five or so. The new crop November contract, 13.39 and a half yesterday, had been two weeks ago at about 12, just, just over 12. So again, strong gains, real drought awareness, drought fears coming in. And and for uh, hard red winter wheat, and again, we're, we have harvest starting in the state almost a Upon us in, in earnest. Most of the time, in normal market years, these are times when uh, we'd see prices, you know, go sideways to lower to be quote soft, as we as we say. Anyway, closed July, the July contract, July Kansas City hard red winter wheat closed at eight seventy one. Uh, had been at 797 two weeks ago. So again, another 80 or so cents gain. And farmers probably are wondering what the uh, possibility is for prices to move even higher. I would say when I look at things chart-wise, going just taking a quick look back at corn, the close at 660 and a half after having gotten up to 670 is, is pretty important. That 670 was up to areas where we had traded back in February or March. So we've had volatility that's taken us back up to areas that, that we're probably going to want some confirmation or some more da- more information before we jump higher then. So that's thought-provoking. Uh, the lowest that contract had been back in early May had gotten down about 545 or so. So again, drought certainly affected us. 
For soybeans, going the same order, we've gotten up to on the high end of trade, just under 15, about 1520. That was the high for that contract yesterday. We had been up to about 1530, 1540. So when the markets start jumping around like this and they don't know exactly where to go, they pay attention to where they've been. So both of those markets have jumped up to areas to where now they're looking around and saying, hey, we're, we're up here. Do we keep going or not? So uh, that's something to think on in terms of people wondering about the future direction. And then, of course, for wheat, we just about have new supplies of wheat to varying degrees coming in around the state. You know, some areas, of course, damaged or, or destroyed crops. Other areas with late rains have come through decently. Anyway, closed, as we talked about yesterday, at 871. Uh, and uh, we had been in er- in early May up to about 920 or so. So you've got a little bit farther to run before you run into the most recent uh, top end side of things. So I, I, I think that most of the attention of, of people right now in the wheat market is if they have wheat out in the field, they're going to try to get it, you know, go try to harvest it. We do have reports, uh, at least as of the 18th of June, which was last Sunday, as I'm thinking, Kansas uh, reportedly was at about 23% harvested. We've had decent weather. What are we now? 35, 40% harvested. And we hear harvest reports coming up from the southern part of the state. And they're mixed, some really good, some not, uh, just up and down. I think over the next two weeks, we'll really have a lot more evidence to work with, Shelby, with regard to what we actually have out there for bushels. That And that may or may not affect what the uh, trend is on prices. Although I, I think that all that's going on in wheat, in both our winter wheat crop, the hard red spring crop, now it's got some dryness affecting it up in the Dakotas. What's happening overseas with Ukraine, Russia are all all an amalgamation of, of roiling factors that have got the wheat market really kind of wondering what direction to go. And again, same same old story at and that we see this happening without a lot of strong U.S. wheat exports. In fact, the numbers working out that some parts of there are concerns by domestic wheat producing uh, organizations of wheat actually coming into the country, you know, to, to compete with domestic producers, domestic storage of wheat. So you have a, a whole mixed bag of, of factors affecting the wheat crop domestically and internationally. And I think the key factor, though, is the drought in the central and eastern corn belts have strongly affected the corn soybean crops that the impact has rolled over onto the wheat market. And now uh, ag producers with uh, crops in the field and, and uncertainty in production are looking at these new crop corn and soybean contracts and are wondering, hey, do I price some of this stuff or not? And so is it fair to say that right now the markets are a weather-led grain market? Yes, definitely. And and you can see it in some of the weather service products that are put out there to give us uh, at least graphic uh, representations of how dry things are. I guess the the western part of Kansas this year, generally either normal or, or wet, given what's happened the last several weeks. You can see that on a predicted soil moisture anomalies uh, predicted through June 28th. What, what we see now in eastern Kansas looked like western Kansas last year. And, you know, just very, very dry, dry predictions of soils. And th- those same very, very dry predictions of, of soil moisture go right up, right straight up into Nebraska for eastern Nebraska. I can't are catching all of Iowa, all of Missouri to varying degrees, uh, all of Illinois, uh, Indiana impacted, uh, southern Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, really uh, all over these major corn producing areas of the United States. And so just a, l- a lot of concern on the parts of, uh, of corn users, for sure, uh, just because of their uh, the fears that supplies be cut back pretty sharp, sharply. And instead of early projections of, gosh, over 15 billion bushel corn crops now, or we're looking at if rain does not come into these areas, are, are we going to get 14 and a half? Are we going to get 14? Heaven forbid, we're going to have, like we had last year, 13.7 billion bushels. If that happens, then we'll hike corn prices for those that can grow the crop. But on the other side, real stress in the in the industries that are trying to buy this stuff and turn it into either uh, energy or livestock feed or, or to export it. And Dan, we've talked about the future markets, but what about cash right now? If there's one thing that's happened, of course, cash prices are higher as they followed this. But you've seen in some of these places, it's, it seems like in the corn market that it's almost as if the elevators in the state have, in this current situation have let the futures take the price higher and still have pretty strong basis levels, but but not surely not as strong as we were when futures were a lot lower. So you've seen that happen. Generally, corn prices uh, run from a high of 724, 721 in Hutchinson, Columbus, 
to uh, a low of of 681 and 61 675 in Colby Salinas so strong grain sorghum bids all running from about at least the places that we're watching the top ones running from uh, 661 to about 686 so strong there soybean bids all, all over 14 uh, again across the, the Colby Salina Topeka Garden City Hutchinson Columbus area again these are the top bids in those areas and for wheat with harvest impending all the wheat cash prices are all sitting there with an 8 in front of them and they're ranging from uh, 826 out in the western part of the state Colby Garden City area 875 in Salina and Hutchinson in the central and in the east about 840 to 856 so you know these are great prices that but I think our producers would be a lot happier if they had more surety of what bushels are actually going to have <laughs> for the next crop before they actually take advantage of some of these prices or have offered to them right now. And Dan, oftentimes we talk about the grain market. We talk about it also on an international scope. And so are there things happening internationally that could impact the markets in Kansas and the U.S.? You kind of strive to find a word to describe it. I think there's a plethora of things, whatever that word means. There's a whole bunch of them. And uh, big headlines that you catch is that crop damage in China has been enough that they're going to they will be the world's top wheat importer this year. And they are normally the world's top wheat producer. So that that's a big thing. I think a lot of that business uh, sounds like it's going to be aimed at Australia because of proximity and type of wheat. But again, that that ongoing drama of Ukraine, Russia, where Russia, in, in so many words, is, is giving every signal that they're not going to continue to export, uh, allow for exports of Ukrainian crops to go. Of course, we've heard this before and in brinksmanship. We'll see what happens at the end, but uh, it, it seems to be more serious this time. And because of that, you see Ukraine going by land into Eastern Europe and causing all sorts of market distortions by those excess supplies there. Dan, I appreciate you coming on today and once again giving us a grain market update. I appreciate it. Thank you, Shelby. Appreciate your work. That was Key State Grain Economist Dan O'Brien, and his resources will be linked in today's show notes, which you can find on actday.net. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today, and we continue today's show with K-State Extension crop entomologist Jeff Whitworth to give us an update on chinch bugs and then talk about a few different insects that producers may also be seeing right now. Jeff, thanks for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Anytime. So what's that update on chinch bugs? Yes, I've been getting a myriad of calls about chinch bugs in the last week or two and pictures sent in, all kinds of stuff. There are more chinch bugs this year, 2023, around the state, apparently in different pockets, uh, than there probably has been in the last 20 years so far. And that's partly because of the drought or the dry conditions, and that means any chinch bug damage that's there just is acerbated, shows up a little more because the plants are already struggling under stress because of the dry conditions. So that's part of it. But there are a lot of chinch bugs. I have seen a lot of chinch bugs and the consultants and the growers around the state are sending me pictures of a lot of chinch bugs. Right now, the chinch bugs are pretty much in the either adult stage or the very early immature nymph stage. What that means is the nymphs are going to be feeding voraciously for the next two to three weeks probably, and the adults are going to continue to lay eggs, and therefore there's going to be more nymphs come on for the next week or two, then those will those eggs will be laid in the stems of the plants, and then those eggs will hatch. Then you got another 30 days, then there'll be another generation coming on. So you're looking at uh, early to mid-August probably when there's another batch of nymphs out there, and that's important because especially if we don't get a lot of rain over the next two or three months and in dry land conditions, because these, these nymphs will feed around the base of the plant, As you know, they suck the juice out of the plant, so they're competing with the plant for moisture, and that can often weaken the stalks. A lot of times we don't even notice that later on uh, because, you know, they don't fall over till late August or till even later in the year, but those stalks have been weakened because of all the chinch bugs that are being produced right now. Another question I've gotten, if growers have given up on their wheat, and they've burned down the wheat or gotten rid of the wheat, and they're replanting sorghum into the wheat, uh, what do they do about chinch bugs? 
And that's a really good question. We haven't addressed a lot. There's really no treatment threshold in that case for early sorghum and chinch bugs, but most of the sorghum is treated with an insecticide, or at least you, it's available. You can get insecticide-treated seed. That seed will help with chinch bugs for 21 to 28 days from the time it's planted until it's a seedling. Those chinch bugs that feed on that plant will die. You know, if you're planting in a whole field, the chinch bugs should not be as dense or as heavy as they are uh, at edges of the field when they all boil out and get into just a few rows of sorghum or corn. So if it's all spread out in the field, there should not be as many chinch bugs per plant as there are on the edge of the field. We have no no uh, data or no experience with planting in a whole field of wheat that is infested with chinch bugs. We are also getting late enough in the year as those plants are drying down as they're senescing. Most of the chinch bugs should be out of the wheat. Once that wheat is within, you know, you know, five, six days of harvest, the wheat's pretty much dry. Most of the chinch bugs have moved out, so they're in some succulent grass, whether that's corn or sorghum, adjacent to the field or in the field someplace. So that in mind, the seed treatments work, but again, they only work 21 to 28 days from the time it was planted, and the insects have to suck a little bit of the juice out to get the toxin in order to kill them. So if there's, you know, if the plants are struggling anyway because of stress and you got a whole bunch of chinch bugs coming out, sticking little holes in them, sucking a little juice out, it may kill the plant, even though it does kill the bugs. But at least that will help uh, reduce the amount of damage as you go out into the field. So that's kind of where we stand right now. Chinch bugs, they're in the adult stage and the immature stage, and they're not going to go away. If you have a bunch of them in your field right now, like I said, they're just going to increase from now on. I've not seen any natural enemies affect chinch bugs this time of year. I've seen it early on, you know, when they're when they're nymphs moving out of wheat, but not from now till early September. I've not seen any natural enemies help a population. So keep that in mind. Also, if you decide to treat for chinch bugs from now on, realize you've got to get that insecticide down to where the chinch bugs are. So those chinch bugs are around the base of the plant, behind the leaf sheath, or, you know, in the ground around the base of the plant. So if you are going to treat from now to August, you got to make sure you use drop nozzles and, you know, directed sprays if you can. Get that insecticide along the bases of those plants in order to protect them because the chinch bugs are really well protected. Jeff, another bug that you want to talk about that honestly might you said might be kind of confusing producers is false chinch bugs. Yes, I've gotten calls about chinch bugs in soybeans. As you know, they're planting soybeans or they have recently planted soybeans and they're coming up and so they're seedling at the seedling stage and I've gotten calls from guys about chinch bugs in soybeans. To my knowledge, chinch bugs don't affect or get into or infest soybeans. Now, I say to my knowledge, because you know when something's hungry, it's an important storm. They might, but for the most part, chinch bugs do not get in soybeans. So what you're seeing is the false chinch bug. False chinch bugs look a lot like the true chinch bug, therefore the name false, but they have a very different biology. And I've seen literally thousands of false chinch bugs on soybean plants. I've never seen them damage a soybean plant. So they'll they'll congregate or aggregate on these soybeans for a few days, and then they just disperse, and they really don't do any damage to the soybean plant. So if the, you think there are chinch bugs on soybeans, I wouldn't worry about it. They're, they're, chances are they're false chinch bugs, or take a good picture and send it to your local extension agent, or send it to me and we'll identify them. But chances are they're false chinch bugs. They are very common in soybeans, especially after you spray your weed. So once you've, uh, you know, sprayed the weeds, a lot of the insects that normally are utilizing weeds as a host, they will move to the soybeans. A good case in point is the burrowing bug. Burrowing bugs, I've gotten some pictures about from of those this year. Burrowing bug is a true bug, really small, actually about the size of a chinch bug. They're shiny black with a little white border as an adult. Right now, you can find, or if you find some, there can be hundreds of them aggregating in different places. That generally means 
you had some hen bit in the field and the hen bit has died or is dying for whatever reason, whether you sprayed it or not, and the burrowing bugs are going to disperse. They will not cause a problem in soybeans, but there can be enough of them that they cause concern, but they actually normally just use hen bit for a, a source of food. It doesn't sound like the false chinch bugs or the burrowing bugs really need to be treated? No. They're, again, they can be out there in the thousands on a few plants, but there's no treatment threshold because they're really not a pest. They're just a cause for most people concerned because of their sheer numbers they can be. So don't worry about it. But just make sure you properly identify if it is a false chinch bug. But if it's in soybeans, it's not going to be a chinch bug. And Jeff, there is one more insect that you wanted to talk about. We're seeing a lot of grasshoppers, and we usually do this time of year. Grasshoppers are normally building up in weed waterways or uh, weedy areas beside fields. Now's the time to treat grasshoppers. If you walk through your field and you have, or walk to the field and you have, you know, a whole bunch of little tiny grasshoppers jumping on your boots and your pant legs, now's the time to treat them because they're still aggregated or they're still contained in those areas where you can, you don't have to spray your whole field. You can just run over the weedy area and you kill them before they become adults and actually disperse out into the crop field. To me, that's that's the best time to uh, get to them. The other question I've had recently, some places around the state have gotten nice rains. Uh, one of the questions I've had is, does water or do rain, heavy rains, kill insects, i.e. especially chinch bugs? And the answer is, I mean, they're insects, they have to breathe air, but I've never seen them drown because of rainwater. They float. Now, I have seen them float on, you know, on runoff, and they. the bad part about that, then wherever your runoff goes, uh, I've seen them accumulate in the corner of a field or someplace so they can really load up corn or sorghum plants in the case of chinch bugs, but they won't drown. I'm just, I'm just here to tell you rain will help your plants, but it's not going to help you with chinch bugs at least. Now, I have seen uh, other things, other insects drown, like they're in the whirl of a corn plant or a sorghum plant, caterpillars or lep larvae sometimes, but not chinch bugs. Jeff, thank you for coming on today and giving us an update on some different bugs that are happening or bugs that producers could be seeing soon. Hey, my pleasure. Anytime. That was Kansas State University Extension Crop Entomologist Jeff Whitworth with an update on chinch bugs. Producers in Kansas may be seeing them in their sorghum fields right now. Jeff also gave us information about false chinch bugs, burrowing bugs, and grasshoppers. If you would like to learn more about these crop insects or other insects you may find in Kansas, you can do so by reading Crop Insects in Kansas book, which can be found in K-State's bookstore. The link to that book will also be in today's show notes, which you can find on agtoday.net. We're cutting to a short break now, but when we return, we'll be joined with K-State meteorologist just Chip Redmond with a weather update. You're tuned back into Agriculture Today, and we finish our Friday show, as we usually do, with a weather update. And as always, we're joined with K-State meteorologist Chip Redmond. Chip, thanks for joining us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So this past week, Chip, we've had a little bit of weather, but maybe still below average hail and wind for what we usually see in June. Yeah, you know, we have had some moisture. And with that, this time of year, we get that convective processes that can lead to severe weather as well. Thankfully, we haven't quite seen as much severe weather as we typically could. June is typically our peak month for the most wind reports because we usually get those big squall lines, big storm complexes that are just big wind bags, we call them. That's not the scientific term. But as those move across the landscape, and they tend to provide a lot more wind damage, and they also bring the risk of hail. Um, we, we've seen much below average hail for this time of year. We average around 130 reports of, of hail in June, and we're not, we've had about 30 of severe weather. Now, we can still have damaging hail without it reaching the severe criteria, which is one inch. And so they call that the white combine because you get that small hail, copious amounts, it gets blown by that strong wind and just it unfortunately does quite a toll on crops. Haven't had as much of that as we have, we, we typically average in June, but we haven't had any tornadoes. And so most of that just goes to say we just haven't had enough wind shear. 
We've seen tornadoes happen in other parts of the United States. We're still seeing tornadoes in the southeast that they just don't get that kind of stuff this time of year. And even further south into, like, Texas, where historically that severe weather shift to north. And it is slowly, mostly along the front range in, in Colorado, Wyoming. But um, we're, we're in an interesting spot, but we are getting some much-needed moisture for central and western Kansas still. Something different than moisture, the temperature. We are kind of, you said, sitting on a heat dome? Yeah, well, when I say sitting on a heat dome, I guess latitudinally we're sitting on a heat dome. We've got a really impactful high pressure to our south in, in parts of Mexico and into Texas that's resulted in a lot of fatalities and a lot of really, really high demand and energy. That's been kind of pushing northward, getting close to us. Um, but every storm system we get, these weak systems, they kind of push that that heat back south a little bit. And so we're right on the edge. And if we end up breaking this pattern out four or five days, then that dome could build in as far north as Kansas. We could see much warmer temperatures. But thankfully, we haven't quite seen that happen yet because of the predictability and, and challenge of predictability with, with these thunderstorm complexes. So maybe seeing some temperatures rise up, but not quite yet? Yeah, we're still sitting right around average temperatures right now. Our highs are in the upper 80s and, and lows in the upper 60s, and we're right at that mark. But when we look at the temperatures of 110, 115 occurring to our south, and all-time records getting shattered in Texas, there is some significant heat that's just waiting to move north uh, if, if the pattern sets up just right. And now looking kind of west to east in Kansas, we're also on the edge of precipitation moving across and maybe getting a little bit more out of drought. Yeah, we, we keep almost daily have these complexes that develop across the off the Rocky Mountains. They move east, they hit the high plains, and then they, they stall out somewhere in western or central Kansas and fall apart. And we're, we're seeing that almost daily. And granted, that means not everybody sees moisture and, and the precipitation isn't spread uniformly. It also kind of fits in where eastern Kansas is seeing falling precipitation averages where western Kansas is seeing slightly the average to, to steady precipitation averages week to week right now because of this kind of a pattern. But we've got a significant drought in north and east of Kansas in Iowa and Missouri that's developing very rapidly and even uh, eastern Nebraska. And that's catching a lot of the, the eastern part of Kansas. And so that dry air and high pressure is, is degrading any storm complexes as they move eastward. And you've mentioned a few times, are we kind of stuck in another pattern? Yeah, it's just been a, a year really of weird flows. And we're, we have that high pressure to our south. And we have another high pressure to our north and east. And we're kind of caught in between them. And it's kind of blocked up that pattern again. And it's granted, it's shifted that jet stream further north. So the best chances of rain are, are more to our north and west. And and for the most part, we're, we're going to stay mostly dry with only a few chances of storms. Chip, I appreciate you coming in today and giving us another weather update. Yep, thanks for having me. That was K-State meteorologist Chip Redmond. That's all we have for you this week on Agriculture Today, but we'll be back with you on Monday. <music>